Hello there and welcome to a video about phase of three physics and collisions. So one of the really nice things that we get with a physics engine is not just the ability to move things around in space through velocity and um, acceleration and so forth. We also get the ability to have the physics engine deal with the whole idea of physical objects interacting with each other. Uh, and most fundamentally, that means that the physics engine can deal with things that collide uh, and make them bounce off each other uh, in various ways uh, or do other things. Uh, and it can deal with the question of whether or not two things overlap. And we can use that um, to interesting effect uh, as well. So that's what really what we're going to talk about in this video is how do we use the Phaser 3 uh, arcade physics engine to deal with collisions and with overlaps uh, and we'll also take a little extra detour into the question of how you start dealing with uh, games that have lots of different entities in them rather than just one or two, which is what we've been um, looking at so far. So you may remember that the current state of things uh, is like this. I've got a little animated avatar square that I can move around with the arrow keys. And I also have this thing uh, that is calling itself a wall, uh, but is really not acting much like a wall. And that's that's really what, where I want to focus uh, first. So the key thing that we want to do here, obviously, is we want to be able to tell our game that the avatar should collide with the wall and stop, right? That's really what we want. And we can imagine how we could actually do that in, um, how we could actually do that in, in standard, sort of just writing the code to do so. But we also know that that would be difficult. And we also know that we are using a physics engine. So let's go and have a look in the phaser three examples. And when we're talking about physics, obviously I think a lot of the time we're gonna be looking at the physics example. So let me scroll down to there. There it is, that's what physics looks like apparently. And we know that we're using the arcade physics engine. So we'll go through to the arcade uh, option. And this is one of the more kind of populous uh, lists of examples. So it's a little uh, challenging, I think, maybe to find exactly what you're looking for. A lot of the time with these examples, you need to kind of browse through and take a look. But I kind of know the area that I'm, um, that I'm kind of interested in here, uh, which is down a little bit uh, here. I think this, this is uh, the kind of thing that we're going to want. Sprite versus immovable. So immovable is the term um, that a lot of physics engines use to refer to physical entities in the world that, that never move. So a wall is a good example of that, right? If you run into a wall, the wall doesn't go flying through space. It, um, it stays where it is and you go flying through space maybe. So if we look at this, I've got the mushroom, it hits the wall and it bounces off, the wall stays put. That's what I want our wall to do, uh, except that we'll be controlling uh, the mushroom equivalent ourselves. So how are they doing this? Uh, well, let's take a look. We know that they're preloading images. That's not very exciting. There's no gravity I can see up here. That makes sense. Uh, so here's the wall. It's helpfully, it is even called a wall. Uh, so they're adding um, an image to their physics engine just in the way that we would, uh, called Flectrum. They're also, they're doing this thing here where they're also doing set immovable um, right after it. So set immovable is the method that we can use on a physics sprite uh, to say, it's, not, it's a thing that just never moves. So let's add that idea to our code uh, and then we'll carry on and see what else is necessary. So over here is the code. Here's where I create the wall. I'm not gonna chain the methods together like they are. I'm gonna do it separately. So I'm gonna say this dot wall set immovable, like that. By default, that will set its immovable property to true. Um, we can also be specific and say, set immovable true. I think that that's a good idea. Uh, it adds clarity to the program. So with this line, we're saying that the wall is immovable, uh, but that's not enough uh, to, to make things collide with it uh, because by default, the physics engine doesn't assume that anything collides with anything else. And the reason for that is efficiency, right? We don't want to be doing physics calculations for everything. Um, we only want to do physics calculations for the things that really, really need them. So what is the other thing what are the other things that we've got here? Oh, and in fact, this is not really, so this is one way that we can check collisions here in update, but it's not actually the way that I want to do it. So I'm actually gonna look for another example because there's a nicer way uh, of setting up how to do these things. And I believe it's up a little bit here. Um, here we are here. So similar idea going on here. Uh, this thing is bouncing around, which is what we want. 
uh, but the way that they're going to create that effect is um, is a little different. So let's go here. So this is the beautiful thing here. So using add, which is this thing we know that we can add um, objects to our physics world, we can also add um, kind of ideas, I guess, or event listeners. So this is how we add an event listener for a collision between two objects. We say this.physics.add, and the thing that we add is called a collider, and the collider is the thing that can deal with collisions between two things. Here they're dealing with a collision between a variable uh, sprite and a thing called group. We obviously want to deal with a collision uh, between uh, the wall and the avatar. So let's copy that and we will pop it. Where should we put it? I guess it makes sense to put it kind of after the avatar is all set up. So I'm going to paste it in there. And instead of the sprite, I want to have the avatar. And instead of this thing that they're calling group, I just want uh, the avatar to collide with the wall. So that is the thing that is going to tell the physics engine uh, when this game is being played, the avatar should hit the wall. Um, so let's just go and double check that that does what we, we wanted. So moving around, and if I go towards the wall, indeed I can't go through it, right? That's solid on all of the sides. Imagine all of the math that that's taking that you don't have to do. Uh, all from that one line of code, right? To, we created a collider. So that's it. That is literally how you make two things collide in phase of three. It's quite beautiful. Um, it's worth just looking at what happens when we don't have set immovable uh, set to true. Uh, because it unlocks other possibilities, right? So if it's uh, it's now it's movable, if I hit it, it actually gets shunted away and it disappears into the sunset or where, wherever it is that walls go uh, when they go off the canvas. Uh, so that really changes the nature of this object. Like it was a wall and now it's kind of something else. I don't know what we would say that that was. Uh, and that's really exciting and there's a lot of design potential involved in making things that aren't that are movable, right? That you can push around. Um, and that's something that we can we can play with as we move forward. But since this is a wall, I am going to have set immovable set to true. And that way it's, it's going to behave like the wall that I want. So that's it. I've created a wall. Uh, there's nothing more to it in, in the sort of the most basic sense. All we need is immovable and we need to add a collider between the avatar, which is the thing that I care about hitting the wall, and the wall, which is the thing that it can run into. And, uh, the physics engine does everything else, including note again that this, there's nothing in update, right? We're not having to do any calculation ourselves, it's just happening. So that's really nice. The other really classic thing that we often want to do in a physics uh, setting or in like any kind of a game setting um, is we want to check whether two things overlap. That's just a very meaningful thing in a spatial setting, right? If two things overlap, it means that they're touching. Uh, and that could mean all kinds of things about their relationship. Uh, perhaps most obviously we can use that uh, as the idea of collecting something or picking it up. So you overlap with it and then it disappears and that means that you, you picked it up. Okay? And so I would like to add um, something like that to this kind of primitive little game that we're building here. And so how do I do it? Well, obviously the first thing that I'm going to need is another sprite that I can actually um, collect. So we can really duplicate this whole idea of the wall, right? To make another physics sprite. So we would say maybe this.collectible is assigned to this.physics.add. I could use sprite or image, it doesn't really matter. Um, since I know that this is going to be not animated, I'll call it an image. I'll put it at 300, 300, and I'll give it the wall image. Uh, just because I don't have another image to use right now, I'll tint it a different color. So this.collectible.setTint. Uh, OX 33DD33. I'm not going to set it to be immovable uh, because I don't want the avatar to smack into the thing that they're trying to collect, funny though that might be. Um, I want them to be able to overlap with it, so I, I want to make sure that they can actually get over, over the top of it. So that should add my collectible in the usual way with, uh, with Phaser 3. So check it out. So there's the collectible there. So the wall, immovable. Uh, the collectible I can move over it, which is good because I want to be able to overlap with it, but currently it doesn't care uh, that I'm overlapping with it. So how do we check for overlaps? It's another formula. Um, I'm not going to go to an example for this. I just want to explain uh, how it works in place. So it's the same sort of concept as the collider, right? We need to add an event listener for the overlap. So same basic idea of this.physics.add, because we're adding another kind of concept to the physical world of our game. Uh, this time the thing that we want to add is called overlap, which is a pretty reasonable um, name for it, I think you would agree. 
And as, as you might imagine, we want to check for an overlap between two kinds of things. So this dot avatar and this dot collectible. Uh, but that's not enough, right? We can't just leave it at that because if I just say overlap avatar and collectible, I mean, yes, the physics engine is now kind of paying attention to when this is happening, but I haven't told it what to do when it happens. So the other crucial part of this is what should you do? And that means that we need to add in um, a function or a method for it to call when the overlap happens, just like uh, we see in, in other kinds of event-driven um, libraries. So I'm going to call this collect item, and I'm going to write my collect item method here so that it exists, you know? Now, when a method gets called from an overlap, by default, it gets passed two parameters, which are the two things that overlapped in the order that they're written here. So it would have two parameters. One of them would be the avatar, and the other one would be the collectible thing uh, that got overlapped with. And that's useful, um, and we'll see that it's, uh, it's especially useful later on. It's better to use these parameters when we're doing stuff inside collect item than it is to um, to just refer, for example, to this.avatar and this.collectible. That's, that's not such a good idea. The other thing that we're always going to want to do, uh, even if we don't need to use it, is we're actually going to want to add two more arguments here. The first one is, is just a null. This is because this uh, potential argument here is just another method that you can use to handle the overlap. Um, it's kind of redundant a large amount of the time. So we're going to send null to say we don't want we don't want to have that method. The other thing which is very important is the final argument that we're sending through is this. That is being done so that when collect item is called down here, it's going to keep that idea that this means the current scene, the current class that we're looking at. If we don't provide this, uh, this argument here, then when collect item is called, this will not refer to what we think it refers to. It won't refer to the scene. And that will mean that we can't use various phaser three methods and so forth that rely on having um, this refer to the current scene. So by adding null and this to the end here, uh, we ensure that in collect item, we can just act like we're still, uh, you know, still using the scene in the normal way. Now in this instance, I'm, all I actually want to do is make the collectible disappear. And the easiest way to make something disappear is with the destroy method. So I'm going to say collectible, which is the thing that was overlapped with, that's being passed through as a parameter, dot destroy. It's a little drastic, uh, maybe a little extreme for the idea of picking something up, but we're going to destroy it so that it disappears and stops being part of the world. So collectible dot destroy. So now we've made a collectible up here. We set its color. We've said that we want to listen to overlaps between the avatar and the collectible, and that when those happen, we want to call collect item. We've also said we don't want that extra method and we want to use the current context of the current scene when the method gets called. And then in the method, we destroy the collectible thing that was overlapped with. So let's go and have a look at that. So the wall is still a wall and the collectible, when I overlap with it, disappears, right? Now, that's great. So that's, and that's it, right? That's the secret to, 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 doing, to doing overlaps. If you wanted another collectible, like we could add another one, right? And this is, I just want to point out the advantage of using uh, those parameters. I'll put this one a little further away. So I'm just duplicating the collectible stuff there and I'll add another uh, overlap here. I can still call collect item for the second collectible because I know that when collect item is called, the thing in collectible is going to be the thing that was overlapped. So I don't need a separate method for collecting the first one and the second one, I can use the same method for both. That's why it's advantageous to use these uh, parameters uh, when we're handling these events. So now there's two, I can collect the first one and it gets destroyed and I can collect the second one and it gets destroyed, right? So that's great. So those are actually the two fundamental things uh, right there. Um, we can create uh, physical things in the world and we can deal with collisions between them, either collisions that send things moving through space, or maybe we set things to be immovable so that they don't get affected by a collision. Uh, and we can also check for overlaps, which is one of the key kinds of interactions that we can do in these physical spaces. Uh, before we wrap that up, because I think we've got like now quite a good big overview of the sorts of things that we can do with Phaser, I want to touch on one more feature, uh, which is kind of brought up by what we did just now, which is if I wanted two collectibles, 
currently what I've done is I've just duplicated code, which we know is not good. And if I had 100 collectibles, clearly this is going to become uh, completely ridiculous uh, and not a good way of doing things. So there must be a better way, right? And, and you know a better way, which is that we would use arrays and for loops. We would like loop through creating each of the collectibles and adding it to an array, and then we could loop through and add overlaps between the avatar and each individual collectible in turn, uh, and that would work. And to some extent, that's kind of what's going on uh, in Phaser when we use uh, the actual technique that Phaser makes available, uh, which is that Phaser has this idea called groups. Uh, and they're very powerful and they're very worthwhile uh, getting, getting to use. So a group is the idea of having a collection of things. Uh, very often it's a collection of sprites uh, that you can kind of deal with all at the same time because they're all kind of related. So let's, uh, let's do that. So I'm going to remove uh, this duplication here to start with. And let's look at the idea of, oh, I deleted the other collectible. That's not what I wanted to do. Let's, uh, let's keep the first collectible. Let's let it live. Um, let's just delete the duplicate. So let's think of the idea that we want multiple walls uh, in our simulation, in our game. How are we going to do that? Currently we've got a single wall, but let's create multiple walls. So to do that we're going to create a group. Um, and the way that I'm going to do this is, I'll just I'll show you, there's, um, in the notes you'll see that there's links to various Phaser 3 examples that also take you through how to do this. But let's just look at the basic uh, syntax of this because it's, it's so fundamental. So again, we're going to want somewhere to put the walls. So I'm going to put them in a walls property. And the way that we add them is, again, as you might imagine with the physics.add um, object uh, or helper or system. And instead of adding a sprite or an image, we add a group. And the way that a group works is that we configure the group inside uh, one of these JavaScript objects. So you can provide quite a large number of different options in here. I'm going to keep it very simple. The first thing that you are almost certainly going to want to do is provide the key of the image that all of the, the members of this group are going to use. So I'm going to get them to use the wall. Uh, key because they're all going to look like a wall because they're all walls. You can also set a number of physics uh, properties while you're creating these things. One of the things that you can set is immovable and I'm going to set it to true because I know that I want all of these walls to be immovable, right? That's the nature of a wall I believe. The other thing uh, that we can do is we can set a quantity. And this is the last thing that I'm actually going to do. I'm going to keep it quite simple. So how many walls um, do I want? I'm going to say that I want, gosh, I don't know, 24 walls. Now that's enough for us to create 24 walls and add them uh, to our game. And in fact, if we go and look at it now, you can see them up here in the top uh, left. That's 24 walls. Uh, but as you can see, they're all positioned at 0, 0, and so they are all overlapping. So we also want to position them, posi position them in different places, and that requires a second step. So this is a, it's very common to require kind of two steps, one where you create the basic group and another where you manipulate some of the properties that you can't easily uh, set in here. So let's add the second step, and the important thing for the second step to know is that we can very easily uh, apply a function to every... Uh, one of the, every one of the, uh, the, the members of the group, they're called the children. So we can say this dot walls, which is our group of walls, dot children, which gives us access to all of the ch children of the, the group, all of the individual walls that have just been created. So there are 24 of these children. And then you're probably familiar with this from other frameworks, maybe uh, from something like jQuery. There's a method called each that lets us call a function. Um, for each of, the, each of those children. So we can provide, in this case I'm providing an anonymous function as you can see. Um, we provide a function and each time it gets called, the current wall that it's looking at is provided as this parameter here. So each time through from the first wall to the 24th wall, it gets passed through as a parameter and we can run various things over that wall in this function. So in this instance, what I want to do is I want to position the wall in a random uh, place. So to do that, I need to generate a position, right? So I need let x uh, is assigned. And then I know that I can get a random number in JavaScript with math.random. Um, and I know that I want to multiply the width of my canvas by math.random. And that will give me 
uh, a random number between 0 and 800, which is a random number on the canvas uh, across its width, right? Um, but we also know that this is, this is not a good idea. We should never really just write hard-coded numbers in here. So what I want to do is I want a reference to the actual width of the canvas that my game is running on. And I can get access to that via this.sys, which is another one of these kind of subsystems that's available. This one has access to all of the kind of basic systems information about the game. And one of those things is the canvas, which we can then ask for its width. So this.sys.canvas.width gives me the current width of my game. So now I'm getting a random number between zero and the width of the canvas. And I can obviously do the same thing for the Y position. Comme ça. And now I'm able to set the position of the wall. And remember, I'm wanting to set the position of this wall that was passed as a parameter. So wall.setPosition is a, that's sort of the easiest way to set the position of something uh, and set it to the current, that X and that Y uh, that I just came up with. Um, while I'm at it, I'm also going to want to set the tint on the wall, right? Set tint uh, to DD3333 so that it looks, looks like a wall. So it's a little bit more involved, right? Like I had to do a few more things than when I was just creating one wall. But the beauty here is that I'm creating 24 walls that are removable in random positions with the tint, right? And there's, there's 24. That's important. And it could be 2,400, right? At this point, it doesn't matter what that number is. They're going to get configured and uh, put into my game. But 2,400 is, uh, is a little too many. So if we go and look at this now, then we broke it. And the reason that we broke it is I forgot one extra thing, which is that because I'm trying to use this inside this function, um, and this is just such a common problem, it uh, does not surprise me in the slightest that I forgot this, um, I need to this to refer to the scene, right? Because I'm saying this.sys.canvas, and that's referring to all of this information that's part of the scene. If, when I'm using each, I want this to mean the same thing as the scene, I need to pass it through as a parameter here after the function. So we've actually got two arguments that are being passed here. The function to call on each of the children and the context that, that they should be using for this, which is the scene or this. Okay, so there they all are. Uh, each time I reload the page, we see that the walls are in different positions. Uh, we also see that they don't do anything except for this wall, which is the original wall. And that's because I haven't told them uh, to collide with the avatar yet. So the final thing that I need to do when I'm using one of these groups is create that collider between the avatar and all of these walls. So I'm actually going to delete the single wall, so I don't really want it anymore, so it's become irrelevant. And here, one of the beautiful things that we discover is I can actually just tell the collider to be between the avatar and all of the walls. We can actually put a group here uh, in the collider uh, event listener, and it will just check the collision between the avatar and every single wall that is available uh, on the screen. So that's it. Like That's all it takes to now collide the avatar between itself and 24 other things on the screen, so that now all of these walls are collidable. I can't go through them as the avatar. And there's my collectible. So now we're really starting to kind of get somewhere, right? We've got a pretty decent uh, sort of weird randomized layout. We could, you know, we could have more walls here if we wanted to. It's a bit more busy, more of a kind of navigational challenge now, which is, um, I think, you know, it's interesting in its own way. Uh, clearly, there there is the desire to um, lay these things out, and I'll talk about that in a moment. I just want to quickly uh, do the same thing with the collectibles though. So let's create a group of collectibles. So we can do the same thing that we did with the walls. So let's just um, take that code and let's call it collectibles. So I'm going to replace the things that say wall with collectibles there. Uh, they're still going to use the wall image. They don't need to be immovable. So I'm going to remove that. I'll have 100. Why not? You know, I'm feeling generous. And I'm going to change all of the things that referred to wall in here to collectible. So it's the same code, right? It's just um, switching out collectible for wall, and I should make sure that I tint it the correct color. There we go. So that's given me all of my collectibles. And then again, the magic is here, I just add the S to turn it into this.collectibles, and overlap works the same way. So I can check for an overlap between the avatar and any of the collectibles, and it will call collect item with the appropriate collectible um, passed through here. So we go and we look, 
and I can pick up all of these uh, lovely green things that I'm excited to be able to pick up. I want to go through there. I can't go through there. It's slightly too narrow. Oh, that's so frustrating. Okay, well, anyway. Um, so there we go. We've got like an actual kind of gamey thing with two of the most fundamental kinds of interactions you could possibly want. The final thing I want to just mention uh, is that clearly this layout here is, I mean, it's, it's amazing, don't get me wrong, it's procedural level generation at its best, but it's often the case that now that you've got this idea of all these individual sprites, you want to lay them out in a more uh, specific way. And I just want to point out that there are tools uh, that allow you to do that. Maybe one of the, the most popular is this one here at, um, at mapeditor.org, but the actual software is called Tiled. It's well worth looking into Tiled if you're wanting to get into more kind of specific uh, positioning of different sprites in a scene when your game starts up. Uh, it's fairly intense uh, in the initial learning curve, but there are great tutorials, including tutorials for how to use it with Phaser 3 specifically. And once you get up and running with it, it gives you a lot of flexibility for laying out your game world uh, rather than attempting to do the entire thing in code with like thousands of lines of code specifically positioning individual sprites in specific places. So I really recommend taking a look at that if you're wanting to go down that, uh, that kind of road. So that brings me to the end of discussing kind of the overall, I guess, spirit of the Phaser 3 game engine. Uh, we've seen a bunch of different features of it, including movement and physics and sprites and animation and the kind of bare bones structure that we can use to get a game up and running. Now, you know, the objective is to kind of run with it, look at the examples, uh, look at the documentation sometimes when necessary, and start building your dream game or indeed your dream weird interactive thing that is not a game. Uh, completely up to you what you do with it. I will see you in the next video. Bye for now.